If you hadn't seen the speakers before, you might think this is the original panel. In fact, it isn't, because unfortunately, Gordon Walker couldn't attend, and uh, Francoise Handy couldn't attend either. So they both have good reasons, but unfortunately, we knew only yesterday that they couldn't come. And we had to find some arrangements, and Petra Butler has kindly agreed to read Gordon Walker's paper. So she will be Gordon Walker for the day. And um, Francesco Schur, luckily, still is on the panel. And Baldur Pohlsen has kindly agreed to spontaneously step in and uh, give a few comments as well on uh, the perspective of Iceland on small states as financial centers. We start with a presentation of Gordon Walker and Petra Butler, who is going to speak on promoting sustainable development in small state island developing states by innovative capital raising solutions. And the case study she presents is the case study of Fiji. Before she starts, I would like to say a few words about her because she hasn't introduced herself properly yet. She is associate professor at the Victoria University of Wellington School of Law and co-director of the Center for Small States at Queen Mary University of London. She specializes in domestic and international human rights, public and private comparative law, and private international law, has published extensively in those areas, and uh, has also held a lot of visiting appointments in various universities across the world. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, yeah, I have to say, so I will give Gordon's paper because he actually has, as you can see, already given us a full-fledged paper. It is a topic I don't know anything about, I have to say, um, so bear with me. Uh, I will try to do it in 15 to 20 minutes. Um, yeah. So as Eva said, his to topic is promoting sustainable development in small island developing states by innovative capital raising solutions. And he focuses in particular about Fiji. I think I will not so much focus about giving you all the details about the case study, but I think there are some themes coming through actually following on from what we've heard beforehand. Beginning in the mid-1990s, a wave of com company and security regulation law reform flowed from New Zealand across the South Pacific. The model for reform was the Companies Act and to a lesser extent the now repealed Securities Act. After the global financial crisis, however, New Zealand replaced its securities regulator and created new financial markets laws. And an important policy driver in the Financial Markets Conduct Act 2013 was the New Zealand government's business growth agenda, which, we, which they view, the authors view, as a rediscovery of the importance of the small and medium-sized enterprise, SME sector, of the economy as a contributor to economic growth and private sector employment. And just to foreshadow that, I think we will hear tomorrow Professor Graves also talking again about SMEs. And I think other than small states, SMEs is the other big kind of what I always call sexy topic at the moment. Um, this policy agenda explains new concessions for SME capital raising in the um, FMC Act. Act including equity crowdfunding. Given the background to company and securely law reform in the South Pacific, one might have expected the new Companies Act 2015 in Fiji to draw heavily on regional best practice, such as the introduction of community companies in the Companies Act 2009 and New Zealand innovations such as crowdfunding. But this has not occurred. Indeed, the private-public company has been preserved, which implies a significant design issue if Fiji transitions to an electronic company's registry. Above all, the sequencing of this law reform initiative is suboptimal. First, a secure transactions personal property securities regime with an electronic registry should have been created before the new company legislation so that company charges could be placed on secure transaction register, thereby removing the need for company charge provisions in the Companies Act. Second, design of an electronic company registry should have proceeded in parallel with the design of the 2050 Fiji Act, 
in order to gain the significant efficiencies that come with an electronic registry. However, while the authors think there are numerous problematic aspects of the new Fijian Companies Act, our, our, their main focus is on the new provisions for fundraising. The Companies Act 2015 came into effect on 1 January 2016. The principal fundraising mechanism contained in this, this act is a prospectus. Concessions or exemption for small-scale fundraising in the new legislations are limited and are modeled largely on the Repealed Securities Act 1978 from New Zealand. The limited exemption for small-scale fundraising in Fiji demonstrates a mismatch between the new capital raising regime and the nature and needs of the majority of business in Fiji, and that are micro, sm micro and small businesses, not even medium-sized. So we're lo looking at the one-person stall owner who sells fruit on the street. For the purposes of this article, um, sorry, so what I am now going to focus on is firstly the Fiji's Companies Act in the larger context, secondly the constraints that are linked to the new sustainable development goals, and lastly the, uh, the anal analysis of the new capital raising regime. So starting with the financing constraints in small island developing states, and this is very general and therefore applicable not only to Fiji. Access to capital is critical for developing countries to achieve sustainable economic growth, and we heard this before. In 2002, the World Summit on Sustainable Development identified access to capital and an enabling environment for investment as one of the core preconditions <coughs> for sustainable <coughs> development. A number of studies, however, document that, that access to capital and lack of an enabling environment for investment are major constraints in developing countries. It is generally recognized that SMEs face special financial financing hurdles. SMEs make up a large part of the private sector, and in the EU it's 99%, uh, and account for a significant share of employment in most countries. Yet they are more constrained in their access to capital than large firms. As for even micro SME, as a MSMEs, it has been estimated that more than 200 million of them lack access to traditional finance worldwide. As a result, MSMEs <coughs> fail to grow beyond a certain size and transition to the next size category. These financing constraints are more pronounced in developing countries, with SME loans constituting 13% of GDP in developed countries, compared to only 3% in, in the developing world. Amongst developing countries, small island developing countries sits, and we have heard this again already today, comprise one of the most vulnerable groups. The sits are mainly located in the Caribbean, in the Pacific, so another, another statistics, we have 23 states in the Caribbean and 20 states in the Pacific, just to reiterate, re, re, uh, reiterate that. So, in fact, SITs are considered a special case for sustainable development. They produce less than 1% of worldwide wealth and face unique challenges as a result of their small size, which adds, amongst other things, to higher macroeconomic volatility, high production and distribution costs, various administrative capacity constraints, limited delivery of public goods, as well as minimal diversification against external shocks, such as global commodity price shocks, climate change, and natural disasters. So the differences between small island states and Pacific small island states. The constraints of the Pacific states are further compounded by their large developmental needs, both in terms of capital and human capital, geographic remoteness, climate change relate, related impacts, and just to give you a little bit also of a view on this, so in New Zealand, we had the first decision uh, actually acknowledging some uh, a family from Kir Kiribati as environmental refugees because their land got so salty due to the rising seawater that they couldn't farm their land anymore. And the other kind of thing you might not know is that PNG, and we just count that as a small state in the Pacific, has 800 different ethnicities. Yeah, that's 800 different languages in one state. 
Yeah? So there are some, I think, special indicators in the Pacific, which makes it even different from the Caribbean, is at least my understanding from the Caribbean as far as I know that. Um, so Pacific smaller, small states are heavily reliant on aid. World Bank data on aid flows shows Fiji received 90 million uh, US dollars in 2013 uh, on official development assistance. So the high aid dependency combined with low access to credit by the private sector constituencies constitutes, uh, con sorry, constitutes a significant impediment to economic growth in Fiji. Access to credit is more limited in Pacific small islands than other sits in the Pacific small states remain stuck on a low growth trajectory. So if we now turn specifically to Fiji, it is evident that growth rates have generally rem remained low in Fiji, and Fiji has failed to achieve the Millennium Development Goals. Um, so Fiji's failure to make meaningful progress towards achieving these Millennium Goals may be explained by reference to several factors, including A, intermittent political instability, which has reduced investment, export, and employment growth, B, poor governance, and in particular, corruption. C, the, glo the, third, the global financial crisis, which affected the flow of remittance to Fiji. Although Fiji became a party to the United Nations Convention Against Corruption in 2008, further progress is required to ensure compliance with the convention. So the er eradication of poverty, including extreme poverty, which is a key focus of the Millennium Goals, is likely to be one of the greatest challenges for the region and Fiji. Moreover, under the new Sustainable Development Goals, envisaged, um, it is, it is envisaged that countries focus on the holistic achievement of economic development, social inclusion, and env environmental sustainability which is especially difficult in the SITS context in light of the financing gaps these countries face. So moving forward, therefore, it will be crucial to identify the institutional means by which financing constraints in low-income countries can be reduced. And if we then again look to Fiji, um, it cannot be, the focus cannot be simply be on development, but it has to be sustainable development, and that basically comes back to our keynote panel, which has been variously defined um, as development, and the one lady said this this morning already, or this afternoon, development that need, meets the needs of the present without comprising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And because of the uh, rising sea levels and the size, it is, that is particularly difficult, a real challenge in the Pacific Islands. Um, so there, are, there is one sustainable development goal, goal number eight, which specifically addresses the importance of sustainable economic growth and refers to the importance of promoting development-oriented policies that support entrepreneurship and encourage the formalization and growth of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. It is generally recognized that the achievement of this uh, Development Goal 8 will require both effective domestic resource uh, mobilization and extensive private sector investment. So how, how are, what, what are the me method, what are the, yeah, what are the methods and ideas this paper develops, how you could achieve that? And there are four. Um, the first one is reforming the secure transactions regime. Um, so land is often commonly owned in the Pacific. So it's another very important feature in the Pacific and hence cannot be effectively used as collateral. This impedes bank lending in the region. The absence of collateral registries for the filing of secured interest in chattels also impedes access to credit. So Fiji does not have secured transactions legislation at present, although an Asian development bank-backed initiative to provide such legislation is in existence. <coughs> secured transaction law reform is critical for domestic resource mobilization. Second, the introduction of community companies. 
a law reform solution which directly addresses the inability of some groups to use land as collateral is, le is legal provision for community co uh, companies. The introduction of community companies can assist community groups in the management of their assets and businesses. The creation of these companies has a number of objectives and they are as follows. The introduction of a simple and inexpensive entity to incorporate and operate which has statutory support and creates very clear obligations for the parties involved. Regular reporting of operations to the principal beneficiaries. For example, the members of the community group. Certainty for third parties who want to deal with the community group, especially creditors, lenders and investors. And lastly, the preservation and protection of the community assets for current and future beneficiaries. So moreover, the establishment of the community company structures opens up greater opportunities for women to participate in business activities. With limited resources, assets and access to finance, women can mobilize the community assets which they collectively own and manage in order to operate various business activities. This leads to benefits for many women and their households and facilitates business expansions through and reduced risk. Thirdly, a small business access to capital bill. This law reform solution requires the drafting of new legislation for small scale fundraising in Fiji. This course of action has several practical advantages. A short bill addressing the uh, micro, <coughs> small and medium sized enterprises context would be prepared. A suggested working title is Small Business Access to Capital Bill. The operative provisions of this bill would prevail over the prospective provisions of the Companies Act 2015, thereby removing the necessity for amendment to that act. The bill would provide for an expanded list of safe harbors to the prospective requirements of the act. Political buy-in should be relatively easy to obtain by reference to the needs of the micro, small and medium-sized enterprises and the role of those SMEs in private sector job creation. So the last solution suggested is an amendment to the Companies Act 2015. And an alternative law reform solution to that proposed immediately above, as I just talked about, requires a short amending act to the Companies Act 2015. Here, the offer to the public <coughs> test would be repealed and following the Australian and New Zealand models, replaced with a bright line rule prohibiting <coughs> all offers of securities uh, for subscription in the absence of, of a prospectus. The prohibition will apply to all offers except where safe harbor applies. An enhanced list of safe harbors, exemptions and or exclusions should be provided. These would include further concessions to small-scale fundraising, including crowdfunding, where relevant precedents can be found in the New Zealand and Malaysian legislation. So to conclude, small island development states face unique challenges in advancing their economic growth and addressing the challenge of lack of access to capital. SITS should take innovative steps to further advance the growth of um, MSMEs by creating an enabling business environment for MSMEs and uh, elevating their financing constraints. An inno innovative capital raising regime is crucial for SITS to successfully implement the post-2015 development agenda. And I have talked to Gordon and I think for him the biggest thing is crowdfunding for, for small businesses. That is, I think, his preferred solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Petra, for being Gordon Walker's voice today.